Hi there. If you listen to the entirety of this episode, I may once or twice fill you in on how you can support the show. I won't bore you with the details now. Let's just get on with it, shall we? This week's episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 3rd of November 2021 at home in Wicklow. And it is essentially a long, a long ranging discussion and exploration of state change and being seen and how we see ourselves and how that feeds into what we look for in the world and how it feeds into what we attract in the world. And it also is in this episode it's also an opportunity to introduce the word hexiety which is a great word that i just came across and it means thisness well that's the origin it comes from latin uh, hexitus which means thisness so basically it's the word that describes your unique quality the quality that makes you you and so that's in the mix as well there are some movie references as usual uh, but the the episode isn't based or inspired by any one movie in particular however there is a little section in the podcast where i'm talking about feeling embattled and the state of brain when you're in a battle and i refer to the depiction of certain battles in certain movies and battles from history so yeah i think uh that's what's coming up. Um, also, a shout out to uh, the legendary Earl Oaken, who features late in the podcast and expresses his desire to be viewed a certain way with a certain amount of humor and self awareness because what he's suggesting is so far removed from who he is at the time of speaking, which was 40 years ago. Uh, that's the joke. Anyway, you'll find out if you listen. I hope you enjoy it. I will see you there real soon. Cheers. Bye. Hi, my name is Dara Clear and you're listening to The Clear Out. Happy November. How's it going for you? It's only about three days in and the, uh, the trees, the trees are looking so good. As they shed their autumn leaves and the wind leaves them held in midair, swooping across the landscape. Absolutely beautiful. Such a great time of year. Here, where I am, I don't know about where you are. I had a video from a friend in Melbourne this morning and it was lashing rain there for their spring. Um, But here, very autumnal. I mean, in fact, technically speaking, In Ireland, we consider November the first month of winter, which is hilarious. Now, there has been a noticeable, a noticeable change in temperature. Colder nights, greater need for that stove to be lit here in hashtag blessed. And darker, the clocks, the clocks went back. They fell back at the weekend. Daylight savings, uh, a phrase I don't recall hearing in Ireland. I I, I don't think we use it here in Ireland. I've never certainly I've certainly never heard people use that phrase in Australia they use it a lot and I noticed a tweet from some American comic referring to it um and they had something quite funny someone put up something I saw somewhere on the dreaded social media and it was in relation to daylight savings and it was a quote from uh, an an American Indian an indigenous American who said only I think the quote is like only a white man would cut a foot off the top of a blanket attach that foot to the bottom of the blanket and think they had a longer blanket (laughs) I thought that was brilliant um yeah I mean it's do you know what it's like daylight savings uh the way I think of it it's like when a cat is lying in sunlight sunlight coming through a window hitting the floor 
And you know the way that sunlight slowly moves across the floor. So the cat is <laughs> the cat is, you know, going from being cozy and warm, basking in that sunlight to suddenly, you know, feeling the encroaching shadow as the sunlight shifts across and the cat simply chases the sunlight and repositions itself to maximize that sunlight. And that's kind of how I think about daylight savings. We're just trying to follow the sun. Um Q, Beatles song. Um, yeah, we're just trying to follow the sun, aren't we? And keep ourselves in the light. So what does that say? What does that say about our relationship with the dark? Uh, we're afraid of it. We don't like it. Go away, darkness. You're not my old friend at all. Thanks very much, Simon and Garfunkel. Um, yeah, so there you go. I looked up through the one of the skylights. Skylights, Velux windows. Hashtag blessed is an old cottage. It's a very, very old cottage, probably a few hundred years old. It's been through various um, evolutions and refurbishments and refits and restorations over the years. It has a, a modern extension attached to it. But one of the things that was done to bring more light into the into the house was to put in several skylights. And... I was looking up through one in one of the bathrooms last night and it was just jet black and there was a a leaf, one of these autumn leaves, just sitting on the window pane as I looked up and I just had a, a brief sense that I was inside a paper mache construction, some form of, I don't know, is, is, it, is it decoupage? <laughs> I was going to go for decolletage but that's that's someone's cleavage isn't it is that right have i got that right or wrong some sort of decoupage uh, or collage patchwork artwork on top of a paper mache structure and it, it was a very weird sensation to think oh i'm living inside uh an encasing of painted uh, hardened paper um, and they're about to cover this black paint with these leaves. It was very weird and strange. Uh, and then I moved on. Cool. Good story. Thanks, bro. Thanks for sharing. So, today's ep e so de. Today's episode, I don't know exactly what I'm hanging it on, but it is another discussion of aspects of self aspects of identity and in a way i am probably going to hang it around the ideas of attraction in terms of what we attract in life and what we're attracted to and how that connects to our sense of self and also also i want to talk about being seen and how that relates to to self and how that relates to identity and what its function is or how we can view it and how we are seen um that's a that's a passive thing um but of course in that conversation we have to look at how we see ourselves also so a few different ideas to to throw in the mix and spend time with and as usual I will try and thread the needle and tie it all together but I think I think I want to start with mm, a new word a new word that I came across for the first time today I, th I believe I have referred in the past to uh, an email I've subscribed to, a little newsletter, which comes into my inbox five days a week, and it's simply called A Word A Day. And the creator of the email, whose name is Anu, A-N-U, Anu, Anu Garg? G-A-R-G, -G. I think that's right. I'll have to go back and check that. I might put a link in the description of the episode if you're interested. But basically, it's an email that comes in 
and each day the focus of the email is a word and that word might be connected it's often most often connected by a theme for the week it might be connected to animals it might be connected to epigrams it might be connected to science it might be connected to i don't know it might be each word has the five vowels in it um yeah who knows i mean lots of different uh, themes but basically you get a definition of the word and its etymology and examples of its usage and then there is a quote of the day uh, to conclude the email so there's always a little tidbit in there and today's word and i, I, I didn't check to see what t- this week's theme was but today's word was hexiety do you like that hex Seity. Now, maybe you're very uh, worded up on interesting words and you go, yeah, I know what that is. I didn't. I had never seen that word before. It's an unusual looking word. I'm going to spell it for you. H-A-E-C-E-I-T-Y. Hexiety. And what hexiety means, it's, it's a word to describe the quality that makes somebody or something what they are. And it comes from a Latin word, hexitus, which means thisness. And I thought, wow, what a terrific little word. Now, in the email, there was a there was a quote uh, for its usage. And they were citing, I think it was um, Elia Kazan, the uh, the director, the movie director. Um, didn't he do On the Waterfront and um, A Streetcar Named Desire, unless I'm mistaken. I might have that wrong. But um, he was just referring to it, and I, I presume he was probably referring to it in terms of character and acting and perhaps what an actor cannot erase or what a person cannot erase in their performance and in their in what they present to life which I think is a very interesting idea. And that's probably what prompted the um, the cogs to turn for this particular episode. Um, so yeah, the that idea that there is something in us that others always see, that we may hide from ourselves. I think that's quite a powerful idea. And... A friend reached out this morning and shared some personal stuff about something that they're going through. And it occurred to me that this idea of hexiety was quite relevant to how this friend was viewing themselves. Because from their perspective, they'd been in quite a dark place uh, and from their perspective they are having a a moment of reckoning in their in their life and finding the courage to face themselves in a way that they haven't before and because of their perception of themselves and their perception of their own narrative it it was largely a view uh, that was negative, largely a view that was negative and and critical and informed by very powerful emotions and sensations of anger and, and shame. And I pointed out to the friend that their, their hexiety, their thisness, their unique ineffable quality shown through regardless of the state they were in because this this friend is a very interesting unique um radiant vibrant open considered individual um and someone who you know an an exciting person to know because they're their own perspective and their own energy is really quite different and incredibly sort of thoughtful and honest um, and informed by many other interesting things. And it occurred to me that, yeah, the it, it was 
what it made me think about was we 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 blind ourselves we blind ourselves to very functional parts of ourselves when we are focused on our pain or when we are focused on our struggle or our battles and we we don't realize that there's something still happening that part of our part of our sort of engine that continues to kind of drive us through each day that continues to propel us through our engagements with life and our engagements with other people that that is something that is almost unstoppable and I know I, th- I think maybe the only way to to really to really stop that um, innate drive and I mean this this goes back to something I was talking about a couple of weeks ago the um, when I was talking about the episode that was called the the thrum of the machine uh, which was a discussion of of character and reducing things down to your sort of base driver and your base sort of orientation in the world, which I argue is a great place to be uh, if you can get there because you, you, you drop a lot of affectations and poses and you, you're not presenting a shape or something that's far away from you. Um, but the... Yeah, you know, to, to go back to what I was talking about, this idea, the the the, the thisness, the the hexiety, it, it, it Yeah, I was saying it probably could only be really, truly hidden, smothered, stopped, suppressed, eradicated by extreme, extreme suppression, perhaps by the use of substances, um, you know, illicit or otherwise. Um, I mean, if you, if you take that idea, I mean, if you, if you go into idea, the idea of, or into, you know, go to move towards the area of, of extreme, um, you know, mental disorder, a disordered brain, uh, a person who, whose brain basically makes them behave in ways that are antisocial or, more than society can handle um and their only way to to manage is to be to be medicated now if you take that to the extreme you can take it to the sort of the the horror the horror sort of scape of you know extreme mental institutions of the past and you know straight jacketed patients staring into space drooling and babbling um or or just just simply you know simply not being present so the medication removes them from the present because to be to be present and conscious and fully in their self is too frightening maybe too frightening for them maybe not um you know if you have manic behaviors it's that that can be an unstoppable force uh I, i'm thinking a bit now of one flew over the cuckoo's nest and that depiction of you know mental care uh psychiatric hospital with a really i mean you go back and look at that movie and check out that cast um very very interesting um you know apart from the obvious sort of stellar turn by jack nicholson um but just uh, the, the, the you know the other actors in the cast like christopher lloyd and danny devito and brad dorif um really really nice and of course and i've just gone blank on her name nurse ratchet what was her name i know not that long ago i was looking at her oscar acceptance speech for that role because i think she gave her speech in sign language because her parents are deaf. Louise Fletcher, isn't that her name? I think so. Um, but yeah, there's a, I don't know, there's a, There's a. if, you, if, you know, if we stay in that area, and, we, and we'll stay with Cuckoo's Nest for a, section, for a second, the incredible 
sadness and poignancy and tragedy of Jack Nicholson's character being being lobotomized at the end of that movie and carried out of the institution helplessly by one of the other inmates inmates patients good lord but i mean inmate is appropriate it's not that's not an inappropriate word hold on it's gonna be a sound of a zip here (laughs) i'm just getting a bit warm (laughs) when i'm talking when i'm talking on the fly that uh that raises my temperature um but it's a very powerful ending to the movie this uh this other patient an american indian who has been sort of bemused and then amused and then clearly um, inspired to have a, a great sort of affection for the Jack Nicholson character. He whips out a water fountain, if I recall correctly, or like a, or a basin, like a freestanding water fountain basin in, in, in their kind of rec room and blasts it through the window. And that's, I believe, that's my memory of how the movie ends. I haven't watched it for a while. Is him stepping through the window holding a sort of lifeless Jack Nicholson and carrying him away. Gosh, now I'm having... Does he... <laughs> I am feeling. I feel very bad now that I didn't actually go back and check all this. Does he smother him at the end of the movie to put him out of his misery? The lifelessness, the lobotomy that has removed the spark of life. I mean, gosh, this, this goes back to last week, doesn't it? And Frankenstein and monsters and creations. Anyway, but let's, 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 let's not lose the track of ourselves. Uh, the idea then of the suppression of personality, the suppression of self. That's an extreme version, the lobotomized version. But then, arguably, arguably you could say that the demand to conform to social expectations is a type of lobotomization of self. When we have to present, we, when we feel compelled to present ourselves in a certain way, just to pass muster, just to function. And the second I use that word pass, my brain immediately jumps to what, um, to what transgender people have faced, to what people who have had to cover or suppress their homosexuality, um, lesbianism, whatever to cover up very fundamental aspects of self. If I think of um, if I think of Martin Scorsese's very contemplative and yeah, very contemplative and thoughtful and in, at places harrowing movie uh, from a few years ago, which the name of which escapes me. Ah, I heartily recommend this movie, the name of which I can't remember. Uh, the one about Liam Neeson um, as a Christian in old Japan. And then the Japanese decided, no, we're not having this Christianity. And they started to persecute the Christians. And Andrew Garfield and Adam Driver are young acolytes, former acolytes of the Liam Neeson character who traveled to Japan to try and find out what's happened to him and where he's gone. And it's, um, yeah, like the, the, the narrative of hiding one's faith and hiding one's spiritual devotion and dedication. And if, if you are a person who is living that life as, a, you know, as a, as a priest, as a spokesperson for your faith, and then you have to suppress that or, or die, suppress that or be crucified, suppress that or be executed, or tortured. Um, I mean, that's obviously been explored in, in, you know, in movies before. Um, I think, if, if, if you think of A Man for All Seasons, where Paul Schofield's Thomas More comes to uh, a point of great conflict with his old friend, Henry VIII. Henry VIII, by the way, brilliantly, brilliantly played by Robert Shaw in that movie. Robert Shaw... Something of, I mean, is he an underrated actor? Do people, do uh, is he spoken about enough? There was, a, you know, an incredibly charismatic character. 
um, capable of enormous charm, but also capable of being very sinister. The four roles that jump in my head are Quint from Jaws, the uh, the, the captain of the, the, the boat they go out on to try and catch the, the rogue shark. Um, also, his Henry VIII, of course, from A Man for All Seasons. His gangster, Doyle, from The Sting, where he's really quite a nasty piece of work, quite heavy. And then one of his earlier roles, um, a sort of Aryan super assassin who, well, it can't be Aryan because he was Russian, I guess. <laughs> but anyway, he um, he's the sort of muscle um, antagonist that uh, Sean Connery's James Bond has to fight a couple of times in uh, From Russia With Love. Isn't there a famous fight on a train in that where he comes a cropper? But um, yeah, anyway. Uh, but yeah, in A Man For All Seasons, he he ends up putting his, his friend, the thinker and man of faith, in the Tower of London because uh, he wants him to renounce to renounce his Catholicism and renounce the church um, and turn his back on his faith so Henry VIII can get on with executing wives and making, you know, making a male baby elsewhere. Um, and... Thomas More refuses to do it uh, in a very, in a very sort of. It's a look. It's a very dramatic piece, and uh, maybe it was. Was it a stage play as well, written by Robert Bolt? Um, but that's uh, that's one that's worth checking out. But again, we're going back to the idea of what I feel I have to hide, what I feel I have to suppress, what I don't want. To let others see, and you know, I can certainly, I can certainly reveal. Um, I'm happy to say, happy to share, rather, that I've definitely had moments like that where I've been in the grip of, well, what I would call depression, and sometimes the depression would, or the depressive state, or the depressive assault, would manifest itself in a type of social anxiety and maybe this is you know if you know i'm aware you know i know of some friends or colleagues people who have you know have had that or suffered from that social anxiety um i know blind boy uh, the the comedian writer um and podcaster blind boy he he's spoken about his struggles with social anxiety but yeah, I know. I mean, I, I can I can recall a handful of times over the years um, just walking out the door and just feeling I don't want to be seen. I don't want to have any engagement with anybody else that I'm barely holding on. I'm barely keeping it together. And there's a there's a terrible how I experienced it anyway was like a, a, a terrible rawness. So a type of vulnerability and rawness that is radiating from deep within that radiates right out to you know, the surface of your skin. So, you know, even to be looked at feels painful. And I mean, I can remember, I can remember coming back from, from England I was living in England for a couple of years. I did my acting training over there. And I remember coming back to Ireland and it was it was a decision that was sort of drawn out of me. My plan had been to stay in England and begin pursuing an acting career and I came back home to to be of assistance <laughs> to, to be of assistance to my dad who had a lot of work on his line was, um, Celtic Tiger, come on, can't get the men, you've got to come home. And then I, I made the decision to you know, relent and leave London and come back. And then there was no work. It was all very, it was a bit cloak and dagger. It felt a bit manipulative. I wasn't sure what the agenda was, but um, it got me back to Ireland. And I just remember feeling very um, upheaved. <laughs> <laughs> upheaved, unsettled, 
and really not sure what the hell to do with myself. Uh, I was in my mid twenties, and I remember working, doing a little bit of work, a bit of landscaping clearance for an old friend of my my mother's, and being in that friend's kitchen, and their young son was sitting in the kitchen. Re- I think he had like two or three books on the go. Um, a precocious brain and this young body. <laughs> I just remember being, I remember being completely psyched out by this kid who was just, you know, he, he, he wasn't doing anything wrong. He's been absolutely himself and charming and lovely. Um, but, you know, my state of, oh, I just don't want to be here. What the hell am I doing with my life? Um, I just, I couldn't handle, I, I felt threatened by the certitude of of his you know his knowledge acquisition and the the scale of it um and i thought right this kid is destined for greatness <laughs> and i'm just utterly lost um and they objectively objectively like absurd there was no reason for me to have any of those thoughts or to impose that narrative on it but it was a reflection of how of of my relationship with myself at that moment and a reflection of being in a type of uh, existential crisis, which which is one of my favourite. That's one of my favourite. That's one of my favourite narratives, um, to put it into sort of philosophical terms and wrangling and wrestling with life and trying to impose meaning and purpose on life. That's that's where I like to go to, you know, to 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 find a frame that I can, you know, that I can walk into Um I'm going to come back to that idea in a second, the idea of being in the frame. But, yeah, so what I'm saying is I can, I can, I can relate to that, that idea of not wanting to be seen and feeling like my internal narrative has become so negative and so twisted and so self-critical and so informed by, you know, so informed by a crisis of self-belief, so informed by a crisis of self-esteem, that to step out in the world is is torturous. And I've never looked up the symptoms or signifiers of social anxiety, but I suspect there are elements of that in the mix. Um, now... To bring it back then, from that point, to bring it back to the idea of hexiety, it's a really interesting thing that when you're in that kind of state and your perspective or your viewfinder, the the lens through which you are viewing yourself is so jaundiced, it's so murky, it's so dark that you become convicted that that is the truth. That is the truth of who you are. And you completely neglect or choose not to see or are or, or, or simply incapable of seeing the other aspects of yourself that are arguably clearly visible to everybody else and you know this is what this you know this is what the exchange with my friend sort of sparked in my mind this morning because I was just thinking that I remember working in London years ago I was in acting school down in Exeter in the south uh, southwest of England and I'd come up to London just to get a bit of labouring work um i don't know how that came about what the connection was but anyway i was up in london and again you know in my mind i didn't feel like i was in a particularly good space i was feeling quite embattled and unsure of myself and yeah just not really in a you know not not at a good moment in my life in terms of my relationship with myself but i remember walking across this uh this building site and another guy on the site was walking towards me, this big 
big, strong London guy who always walked with his feet at 10 and 2. Um, really, like this bizarre gait, you know, wide open to the world. I mean, I don't know, maybe... <laughs> <laughs> he's a very nice guy but maybe he was you know presenting his presenting his manhood to the world in as open a way as possible um and he had his his hard hat and that's not a euphemism he had his hard hat uh kind of low over his brow and it's kind of marching across the site passes me and he just greeted me with a simple hello smiler and was that Aussie? That was meant to be London. What the hell? That that thing is, you know, this this has dogged me since living in Australia. I go to throw in a London accent, and I come out with an Australian one. Accents, bloody elusive. They are for me anyway. Uh, I have to say, my cousin at hashtag my cousin who lives here beside me at hashtag blessed. He's he's got a great a great ear for accents. I'm being distracted here. I don't know if you can hear that noise in the background, but. Ruby, the marketing assistant, is just climbing up the curtains and getting herself stuck on the window rail. Oh, brilliant. There's this ledge over the window inside. This is inside the house. I haven't, I haven't even noticed that before. But there's a, yeah, a ledge, like a recess above the window uh, at the top of the wall to the ceiling, which... Um, it would be perfect for my collection of Mexican vases. Okay, disclaimer, I don't have a collection of Mexican vases. But if I did, that little ledge in the recess would be perfect. But that is where Ruby, the marketing assistant, has parked herself. And she's, she's swiping a paw gently in the air. She must see some sort of insect up there. And now she's trying to catch her own tail. Brilliant. Anyway. Uh, sorry, the distraction. Um, so yeah, this guy said, hello, Smiler, and kept marching on. And I thought, that's interesting. That's how, he, that's how that guy sees me. He sees me as, <laughs> as Smiler. And it was, it was just an instructive moment to me then to go, oh, okay. So... It just opened up that window in my understanding to go, right, so what's happening for me internally doesn't necessarily reflect what's being seen externally. And, you know, and that, you know, and, and it wasn't like I was putting, you know, putting on a big show of being well or being happy or being confident. Um, I think I was, you know, I think I was in this sort of, um, you know, metamorphic stage this transitioning stage of beginning to to see those shoots of understanding myself better and not and I mean and this was part of the process of being in acting school, you know, stripping away the front, stripping away the facade, getting down to the, 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 the you know the core self, and then you you build from there. So you're building from a, a place of authenticity and whoa. <laughs> that was a that was a ninja drop by by ruby what the hell cat just settle down um yeah so this is the point let's argue that my smiliness whatever the hell um that that is or was then that that was my my thisness that was my hexity and that is what i couldn't see but others could and if we relate this idea to state change i think that can be a useful concept to to bring into the conversation when we're talking about having a perspective on ourselves and when we talk about understanding our wellness uh, wellness journey i don't know that's that sounds a bit wet that's not really what i'm talking about but a state state change in terms of in terms of our I, maybe just in terms of our 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 journey with ourselves and state change in terms of our journey with our own narrative 
And if I take a very, you know, just very simple, very simple um, real world material example, this is the first time in three weeks that I felt well. So the last three episodes of the podcast, you heard me whinging about being a bit sick. And while I was sick, any anytime I'm sick, I often think, am I really sick? Is this really happening? Or am I just being a bit soft? Um, because I'm so used to being active. I'm so used to my you know regular exercise. I'm so used to having those resources of energy at my fingertips. And the the state change from wellness like physical wellness and strength and energy and vitality um and stamina that state change from that to suddenly that stuff not being available and then being in the middle of the 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 dearth or the the drought uh, of those things and questioning it and having having your reality having the reality challenged and having the reality altered but somehow still going maybe this isn't real and then coming out of it which is where I am today the last couple of days and going oh wow yeah this is this feels normal that didn't feel normal and now I can validate it after the case and state change is like that because the the transition is a battle and when you're in a battle, <laughs> when you, when, imagine it. You think of something like, you know, whatever. You can go to historical precedents, um, you know, Waterloo or the Battle of Clontarf, <laughs> um, 1014, when the Irish were victorious against the Vikings. But you can think of those or you can think of one of those epic battle scenes from Game of Thrones Um I think, was it, uh, what was the Anthony Minghella movie? One of his last ones set in Cold Mountain. Was that the one? I think there was a pretty grim Civil War mud bath war scene, which was absolutely horrendous. Uh, also, Saving Private Ryan, of course. That's probably that's probably going to go down as um, the, the high watermark uh, for battle scenes in, in the history of cinema. But if you try to think... You know, think of those scenarios, think of the historical ones, think of the ones that have been presented in movies. And if you think a soldier in the middle of that has the perspective or the presence of mind to kind of pause and go, oh, hmm, I'm in a battle. This is a war zone. Oh, how interesting. Oh, look, shrapnel. Oh, wow. Ah, there's Jerry. His leg just got blown off. That's not going to happen. That's not what happens. When you're in a battle, it's survival. You're not outside it. You're in the middle of it. And it's only afterwards that the body changes, that the mind changes, that the self readjusts and goes, okay, now, now you can relax. Now you're back in a normal mode of behavior uh, that isn't, about survival and that then is where you can take a better read you can take a better measurement of self so the you know the transition then from sick to not sick uh, or from you know not well to well from at war to at peace these these are these are you know these are not insignificant changes but the the transition the journey that is that's a vulnerable time i mean there's no two ways about that and yet my argument is that throughout those changes throughout those transitions those you know metamorphic uh phases that one's hexiety one's ineffable thisness one's uniqueness is still there regardless of how you see it regardless of what you're experiencing and that's interesting and it's interesting because this then brings me to the idea then of what do you see what do others see and 
What is the role of others in seeing us? So that's a question. Like, what is it to be seen? Now, I'm not talking about recognition in terms of someone going, oh, there's there's Dara or, you know, whatever. Put yourself in the picture, you know. Um, someone goes, oh, there, there's, there's such and such. I know him. I know her. Or there's, you, you know, a guard or there's a nurse or there's whatever. I'm talking about to be seen in terms of someone really sees who you are as a person that type of being seen which is something that maybe i don't know maybe that's something that we first experience with a with a romantic partner um that journey um that vulnerability that openness um maybe that's something that happens with a with a mentor of some kind um i don't know if that's something that might happen um i I mean i don't think that's the role of a therapist or a counselor i think their role is to help help you see yourself and to give you the equipment to to view yourself with compassion i suppose um and to view yourself in you know in 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 an objective way um to to achieve to achieve healing or closure or trauma negotiation or whatever it is but outside that space what is it to be seen and i'm just wondering i mean i'm asking myself this like i mean i'm i'm wondering is you know to be seen by others and you know if if you if you believe in that as something that is useful or if you believe in that idea as something that is valuable uh it's really in some way it's it's the seeking of confirmation or the seeking of affirmation and it's a form of faith that somebody will recognize your value or your worth um that will somehow, and this is where the confirmation idea that that and that that will somehow confirm what you hope or suspect to be true about yourself. And I suppose I'm thinking of it in positive terms. And of course, if you're depressed or you're dealing with anxiety or self-loathing or whatever, then then it's then it's very different because then to be seen to go back to my my. <laughs> <laughs> my encounter with the boy genius um you know then to be seen you know if you're in a bad headspace to be seen is to have your your negative perception of self confirmed which is i mean that's that's a very painful thing and it's a very i think it's a very dangerous thing and it's a you know it, it, it's quite a destructive thing and this is why it's so important for us to 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 heal ourselves and to move away from the the negative ideas we have about ourselves um and to not seek you know to, like to have a, to have a confirmation bias that tells that is essentially uh, a message to ourselves that we are worthless a message to ourselves that we have no value and then when we look out into the world we seek maybe not consciously but where we see confirmation of that conviction about ourselves, that is, that's, that's a form of hell. That's torment. And I believe it's completely escapable. I also believe that it's probably quite universal. Um, and it's the challenge of, it's the challenge of self-care to remedy that. And it's the challenge of personal responsibility to take ownership of that and take ownership of the the healing process um and i'm you know again the idea of being seen you know the visual i'm i'm moving i'm gonna, i'm moving quickly on from you know I'm, I'm moving quickly on from the idea of something very profound in terms of 
an in the flesh encounter with a person who sees you and validates you in a very present mindful open way that can come from a place of it can come from a place of romantic love it can come from a place of platonic love or regard it can come from a place of tremendous confidence and disinterest if i'm using that word correctly um, where someone doesn't have a stake in you they're not trying to manipulate you they're not trying to get something from you they're not trying to harm you so they've got they've got their they've got their own confidence um, and their own presence that they're comfortable with that allows them to view others without any ego involved and that, that that's a kind of person that can see you that's you know that that could be a mentor figure that could be i don't know i mean I mean, that's a that's another discussion. I mean, who, you know, whose vision of you do you trust? Um, I mean, that's a question. You know, who do you trust when someone says, I know who you are, this is what I see. And you go, oh, I don't like the sound of that. Is that true? I mean, that's, um, I don't know if that can be, that, 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 that can't be explored empirically. So then how are you led? How are you led to, you know, to, to, to a judgment that you trust? And... Personally, at this stage in my life, I'm led a lot by feelings, by my feeling of safety around people, of my feeling of um, my, my, my sensitivity to <sighs> my sensitivity to regard um, in another person. So I trust that that this person it doesn't have an agenda i mean i mean maybe that's what it is um i, I feel like i'm highly tuned to you know the undercurrent what's going on what <laughs> and you know i'm not trying to view i mean and, and i think we all do this i'm not trying to view um people in a in a transactionary way relationships exchanges what do i get from this what are they trying to get that's not somewhere i i, I go to but I think if you're around people that you don't trust, if you're around people that after you've been with them, you feel bad, I kind of go, they're alarm bells. That's, you know, put a question mark over that person. What's going on? What's the agenda? Why can't they um, accommodate you? Or why can't they be in your presence and be, I don't know, be be non aggressive or um you know what's what's going on what's in the mix that's um you know we've got we've got to be wary uh, i i that's that's you know for me personally that's how i feel I'm, I'm very wary of those exchanges um and that then brings me to the idea of you know of attraction and i am going to come back to the visual the visual thing in, in a moment but just to go back to then to the idea like just speaking about that what are you looking for? What are we looking for in people? What are we looking for in the world? What are we looking for from the universe? If you want to think of it that way. Um, you know, the, the universe as, you know, the, 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 when, I, when I speak about the universe, I, I really, my, I think my understanding of the universe, I'm not talking about stars and planets and black holes and all the rest. Um, as I conceive of it, when I talk about wellness, and one's relationship with life i think of the universe as unending possibility and i think of the universe as a benign place a benign presence that a benign world um <laughs> i mean the world is in the universe but so a benign realm or sphere or energy that we live in and i don't know i mean i suppose i suppose there's a part of me that makes that attributes a certain omniscience to that universe that it can see but it's a non-judgmental universe but it's benign if 
yeah, I think they can coexist, can't they? Um, now I'm aware that that's just that's just a narrative um, uh, that I like. That's all it is. I like it. I find it comforting to think about you know the 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 the, the great out thereness of life and the universe um, as being that and. That was my question. Like, what are we looking for from that? You know, what, what do we, what do we want to attract? So you can talk about what we do attract. So what kind of experiences seem to happen? What kind of people seem to be in my life? Um, what kind of relationship do I have with work, with with money, with relationships, with intimacy. I mean, I put all of that into the attraction area. What do I attract? Do I attract good experiences? Do I attract good business experiences? Do I attract good relationship experiences? Um, and, you know, what is that what I want? Because that's, that's, a, that's a very key, I think that's a very key question in unlocking um, dissatisfaction or unlocking frustration or unhappiness when you go well is this what I want and the the, the 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 question beyond that is then well if this is not what I want how do I attract what I do want and you know we're still in the same area of you know what what do I see what do I see in the world reflected back at me? So if I'm coming from a position of having a very negative perspective on myself and then I see confirmation of that in the world, perhaps that's what I'm going to attract. I'm going to attract that back to myself, that I am worthless or that I am of low value or that I'm not good or I'm not functional or I'm not good enough to get what I want. Um, and I think... The response of the universe is, well, if that's what you're convinced of, that's that's really what you're going to see when you when you look in the water. Um, uh, I was thinking of narcissists there. <laughs> what do I see? My God, you're good looking. Um, you know, th- what do you see when you look in the mirror? What does the universe reflect back at you? So if that's what you see, like it's an interesting idea because if we're operating from a place of defeat, a place of self-loathing, and that might instill in us feelings of fear, fear of failure, uh, fear of rejection, and those fears then may may create in us a type of desperation, um, a type of a, a desperation for for resolution, a desperation for affirmation a desperation for a fix that involves me not looking at myself desperation which is a product of fear really okay like if you know you know in an ideal world like if if if, for example the universe is as benign as i say perhaps that desperation would attract a savior of some kind okay i'm getting into funny territory there because I think really what I was, you know, my, my fundamental argument is if, you know, fear attracts predators. So that's, that's a very, that's a very uh, interesting dynamic, you know, fear and vulnerability rather than attracting someone who can, you know, fix you and make you well. It may attract predators, someone who has a need you know, you will satisfy a need in the other person to feel strong, whether or not they are strong. So that can be a dynamic. Um, but when I use that word savior, it occurred to me that, you know, it, it, I think I believe it's a it's a it's a phenomenon with certain religious groups that they actively seek out vulnerable people to proselytize, to recruit to their faith, which I just think is grotesque. I think it's absolutely repellent. Um, and manipulative and dishonest um, I think go to someone when they're strong and can make better decisions and then say have you considered this would you be interested but there's a I think there's like a, a radar um, it's like a, it's like a shark cruising for for smaller fish you know 
and then I think of the fish symbol that represents our buddy Jesus. Uh, anyway, I didn't mean to go to that place. Um, so again, the idea of attraction and what you attract and what you want to attract. And I suppose what I've come back to is, you know what? Again, I don't have any control. I don't have any control of that. I only have control of what I'm doing. I only have control of my choices, my decisions. I only have control of feeding my own strengths, my own interests. I only have control of investing myself in things that give me a sense of wellness. And I believe if I do that successfully, what I achieve is a type of personal validation and fulfillment from listening to myself and responding to my own needs for for achieving purpose, for achieving a sense of usefulness and for achieving a sort of personal satisfaction or gratification from the things that I'm doing. And I believe if I do that successfully, that that becomes an attractive energy that I become an attractive entity and then what happens, happens. So it's very much, I make my world a good place to be. So my personal orbit then attracts other positive planets. Let's put it that way. So I'm my own little micro solar system. (laughs) Now I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I'm the sun. I am the S-O-N son, one of four. But um, yeah, I think you get I think you get the analogy, don't you? So um, I wanted then to to like to return to the idea then of of being seen. And I think that social media, which is such a visual um you know like each individual social media platform um the the big ones like facebook the big ones um like instagram uh whatever else i mean tiktok now if that qualifies as social media i suppose you know whatever they're very visual media and we have been living with them now for quite a long time and they have been absolutely prolific they have been you know they, they, they've taken over our our screens they've taken over our lives in many ways um my wife had a funny one with me this morning she's she does a great uh she does a a good line in kind of um you know I, I, well one-liners i suppose which makes me laugh she's good at giving me a good slap every now and again i was having a whinge about my phone this morning and i was just sitting on the couch saying gosh my, my phone has has become non-responsive I, I i don't know i don't know you know what causes that and my wife just looked at me with a sort of you know sarcastic look uh, from the other side of the room and said overuse <laughs> which I thought was very good. Um, <laughs> now, <laughs> I know, you know, part of what I'm doing with the with the podcast and trying to promote the podcast and draw traffic to it has required me to set up a Facebook account and to set up an Instagram account to try and plug it and give it a bit of a profile boost. And that means I am on my phone more than I have been in the past. Um, also, also, a lot of stuff happening with my football club at the moment. My beloved Spurs sacked their beleaguered Portuguese manager um, and have, have, have hired a new Italian manager um, who's had a great track record of success. Um, I'm quite excited to see him come into the club. So I'd just like to say a bit of a shout out there to Antonio Conte, who's a uh, volcanic passion and commitment to winning at all costs i welcome i welcome it very much at my flaky flaky club i can't wait for him to light a fire under those guys 
and see what he can make them do. That's exciting. And farewell to poor old Nuno with his big sad eyes. Uh, it was an ill-fated relationship from the start. Four months, 17 games. See you later. No hard feelings. He was the wrong man for the job. Hired by a... Ugh. Anyway, I'm not even... I'm, I'm going to get away from this topic. So look, what I'm going to argue is, I'm wondering to myself, is this relationship that we now have with social media, this relationship we have with presenting ourselves to the world on social media and the curation of the gallery of self. This, I think it's like, it's a disease of the imageification of one's life, making everything an image and an endless procession of snapshots of, of ourselves. And what it does is, it, we're, we're, you know, we're volunteering to objectify ourselves. And what we're doing is we're making uh, these kind of, you know, parcelized um, narratives of our life, of our lives. And we start to live there as if it's a reality. And we start to become consumers of our own narrative. And that objectification of self, it's distancing. It distances us. It distances us from ourselves. It distances us from a much more intimate, closer, lived reality. And you know what, what what happens to us all then, and I've noticed it as well, just starting to use social media for the for the podcast, is you start presenting images that are part of a narrative that you're trying to sell. Because you want it to be consumed. And so your question is, what's my narrative? And what everyone does, and I'm guilty of this as well, you start believing that your incidental day-to-day tedium, the you know, the, the, the everyday nothing events are worthy of narrative. And that stuff is like that's just incidental stuff. So you put a picture of, you know, your lunch, or you put a picture of you know, you in bed because you're sick or a box of tissues and a, a lemon and honey drink or, you know, everyone at the moment, I, I was having a laugh with a friend online because everyone's putting up photographs of autumn leaves, <laughs> which I did as well. And I was going, oh, Jesus Christ, you know, look at you with your leaves. You think you're great. Um, but the real narrative, I think, is why do we feel the need to live in that space? Why do we feel the need to present ourselves to the world now, to curate, to perform, to objectify ourselves. And you know, oh, look at me, here I am with the things that I'm interested in. And I mean, I'm saying this fully aware of the irony of, you know, I, here I am trying to plug my podcast. Now, my counter argument in defense of myself is what I'm interested in is long form discussion, long form reflection. That's not just easily consumed. And my my blog, my website reflects that because what, if you go there, what you're going to find, I mean, apart from, you know, a dozen poems, apart from some short stories, largely what you find there are think pieces. So think pieces, anything from, you know, 1,200 to 1,500 to 2,000 words long. Again, not really easily digestible snapshots. So it's not a butterfly it's not, uh, you know, the, 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 my, my default reference is it's not a kitten in a coffee cup. And I'm trying to kind of go the exploration of knowing oneself better, the exploration of defeating one's demons, the exploration of coming to a place of peace with oneself. That can't be captured in a Facebook post. It can't be captured in an Instagram post. Uh, a TikTok video. It requires hard work. It requires um, attentiveness. It requires real uh, self-engagement and self-interrogation. And yes, it requires a form of um, of mindfulness. And I believe social media takes us away from all of those things. And social media steers us into a curation of self. 
and it steers us into you know presenting a defined self a defined named self and that might sound initially like it's a positive thing but i'm wondering is is that more like a, a straitjacket where it, it's actually an abstraction of self it's an offshoot of self and we're no longer in the self we're no longer present with the base state what we're doing is we're presenting something that we go this is what i want people to see and then the question is then the question circles back to what are you trying to attract what are we trying to attract and why do we want that and i think on a very basic level we we all get caught up in the addiction of the the notification ping the, the the little dopamine hit of oh someone looked at my photo oh someone responded to my post oh look at all those hits i got isn't that lovely and it becomes kind of meaningless because you're getting away from well what the hell is the thing for me the thing is write the write the piece write the piece for the website that's the thing for me the thing is write the poem go on that journey for me the thing is do the podcast that's the thing and then everything else hopefully follows from that 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 actually reaches someone in a meaningful way and for me that is being seen because that's my offer my offer is i've thought about this i'm doing it because it's beneficial to me i'm processing by producing this little article i'm processing and expressing something by presenting an idea or an emotion or an understanding or an attempt at understanding in this poem in this short story uh, in this podcast and then if someone takes the time to read or takes the time to listen and then takes the time to circle back to you and go you know what that was really cool or that was interesting or oh i recognize something there that to me is being seen and then the value of being seen is it's a validation it's it's a form of energy that is strengthening it's affirming and motivating and the motivation part of it is it motivates you to to move on it motivates you to move forward it motivates you to commit and to continue doing what you believe is making you well keeping you well and in my case that's the stuff i'm doing um but the you know the 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 if we if we go down this other road of the presentation of self we get caught up in making a product of ourselves and then we're in a permanent mode of presentation we're in a permanent mode of presenting the product and that as we all know is incredibly artificial because we're 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 being sold something you go into a room where someone's doing a presentation you know you're being sold something whether it's new policies at work whether it's new software whether it's a new you know new um you know intranet um you know a new marketing strategy you know you're being sold something and i'm very resistant to that personally i'm like oh here listen just get away from me life's too short you know my argument is the erasure of like ego conceived self is liberating stripping away all you know all that kind of performative curated presented stuff and bringing it back to what's the you know what's 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 the organic product here what's real because i have a lot of faith in that i have enormous faith in that even if it's just for me i mean and that's the simple truth like that comes back to well i'm doing it because i enjoy it i'm doing it because it gives meaning to me and then anything positive that happens after that is is just a very happy byproduct you know um now i know i had a couple of other little thoughts to throw in here before before i wrap it up um i think i've covered most of it <laughs> i was just i was thinking when i was talking about that uh, the objectification of self um 
you know, it, it reminded me of the very first time I ever heard the phrase sex object. And I mean, I've spoken about this before. I spoke about this a few episodes ago about, you know, the, the sexual objectification of, of women, which, you know, is is an erasure of personality um, and a dehumanizing, um, you know, there's a dehumanizing aspect to that. But the first time I ever heard that word sex object was coming out of the mouth of an English singer, musician, comedian called Earl Oaken. And I had a tape of his that I think I'd been given by my uncle or my uncle had left it at my parents' house. And it was just called Earl Oaken himself. And I think the cover was a simple little illustration of a little derby hat that he wore, glasses and cufflinks or his shirt cuffs with the cufflinks in them. And it was a little live performance. And he'd do his, his kind of, you know, his, his music style was kind of, you know, jazzy, bossa nova, um, you know, kind of lounge music. But he'd do kind of funny versions, spoof versions of, of standard jazz standards, as well as performing old kind of Duke Ellington numbers and stuff like that. And then he'd do comedy numbers and he'd throw in a little bit of his comedy banter between sets. And he was discussing feminism. And then that was his quip. He said, I don't mind, you know, women can do what they want. And I only have one, you know, one demand. I want to be treated as a sex object. And, you know, I could hear the, the audience, you know, laughing their asses off. And whatever age I was, 10, I was like, what's a sex object? I don't know. So, I mean, I think that was, yeah, a 1981 recording. But I must have been listening to it a year or two later. So I could have been like eight or nine or 10. And, um, yeah, the, 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 the humor, of course, was that Earl Oaken used to present himself in, you know, like, like a bit of a, a nerdish kind of dandy. Um, with kind of spats and cravats and you know he was like a sort of you know vaguely Woody Allen-esque in appearance and and he was also known for playing the mouth trumpet so making quite a tuneful trumpet sound that he'd throw into his songs um, without the use of the actual trumpet instrument just uh, of his own creation quite a quirky funny interesting character who is still alive and well as far as i know i think born 1947 um yeah so what does that make him 74 is it yeah so um the objectification uh, of of oneself um and in his case he was he wanted to be a sex object good old earl well worth um well worth checking him out very quirky very funny and actually yeah, really nice when he was doing his, his straight up stuff. Really, really nice and mellow. Um, okay. I don't know. Look, what's my conclusion? I know I had one or two other points. I can't quite bring them from the, the back room of my brain. So I'll conclude. I'll conclude with this thought, which is pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And maybe I'm just stating the obvious. But what we put out into the world is what will return to us. I think it's as simple as that. And when I say put out, I'm not talking about extinguish, quite the opposite. It's ironic, isn't it? Um, you get that phrasal verb to put out. Um, but what it means in this case is what we radiate, what we give off, what we put out there, that is what will return to us. So, you know, invest in the idea of of leaning into your strengths, your innate positive qualities, the things that make you feel good and invest in being loving and positive and being unafraid to express that without the expectation of a return, um, without condition. Uh, and that all becomes, that all becomes a, a very radiant light all of its own. And believe me, you know, you'll attract more than moths. <laughs> okay let's leave it there um heck see it embrace your thisness embrace your unique qualities that make you you why not you may as well because there's no guarantee that anybody else will 
Give yourself a big old hug. A big filthy hug. Embrace yourself. Okay, take it easy. Be well. Um, throw me some love on social media if you dig what I'm doing. Uh, and if you want to throw support in a financial way to this very much independent podcast, you can do so by using the supporter link, which you'll find in the description for a one-off contribution or else using patreon.com forward slash the clear out to make a modest regular contribution i would welcome whatever you can give but you know if you don't have to no pressure if you just enjoy it and feel like spreading the word that's that's great as well okay you have a great week take care go gently mind yourselves i will talk to you real soon all the best take care bye